Hello, welcome to another edition of Space Oddities on a Monday. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we're here tonight again with uh, this illustrious panel that I'm with. How are we, panel, today? Fine, thank you. Good, thank we're you. We're very fine. Thank you. Thank you. Doing good, Hello. thanks. Hello. Welcome to another edition of Space Oddities. Someone's got Great. the microphone on. So, the... we've got a lot to get through tonight. So, uh, we're going to start this evening uh, with Simon. Uh, with, no, with Roger. Roger, can we come over to you? Oh, hello and welcome to our second broadcast of our new show. Um, I've got a few items that I'm going to be presenting in a, in a PowerPoint for the week ahead regarding uh, the moon and some planets and some other interstellar objects. So if I will give you a share screen. Right. Okay. Right. Okay. So this is for the week of the 6th to the 12th. And as you can see, we've got uh, a first quarter for tomorrow evening. But there is something of interest uh, this evening if you're able to have a clear sky to see. Uh, a lunar X and a lunar V, which will just be coming into uh, visible later this evening. And I will just show you where these are located for you to be able to see it if you're not aware of these objects. Uh, OK, so these are uh, known as Claire Obscura, which gives uh, the illusion of something which is visible. Um, to uh, give an appearance of a letter V. Uh, you can see it there. Uh, I've just highlighted it there to give you the idea of what it is. And further down on the uh, Terminator is the Lunar X. Uh, I'll just highlight the shape there. Uh, these will be visible later on this evening. And uh, also of interest, there is a... a face that will appear, the shadow, uh, uh, sort of a profile of a, of a face in the crater Albategonus. I'll just highlight the shape there, just to give you an idea. It's only due to the fact the altitude of the rim that gives the shape uh, cast by the shadows that gives the illusion of a, of a face. So that's quite interesting as well. But later, on the 12th, there is going to be uh, an occultation by the moon in Delta Scorpii. And that will be visible mostly in uh, the North, North America, usually around the uh, northwest coast. Uh, it starts around um, about 10 o'clock and it takes about 52 minutes for it to uh, transverse from one side of the disc to the other. I'll just give you an animation now. So roughly about, about uh, 10 past 11 uh, UT time, uh, that will be available to uh, see in North America. That could be quite interesting. Right, so Northern Hemisphere for the planets, for uh, in the morning, we've got uh, Venus, Mars, Jupiter and Saturn rising up just after 4, uh, 4 a.m. in the morning. Uh, they should be visible um, fairly easy if you've got a good lower horizon for Venus, although the other objects will be a lot higher up. And as we progress through the week, you will notice that Venus is... Uh, getting nearer to uh, sunrise while the other planets gradually move uh, further away. And uh, that will be quite interesting. But in the Southern Hemisphere, you get an extra planet. You get the planet Mercury visible. Uh, and that is in, down in the east, rising up. And uh, also you will notice that the, uh, Venus is also moving away and also Mars is moving away from Jupiter. So that can also be of interest if you if you want to see see that. Now, 
Um, I've just put this in as a matter of interest if you're interested in comet pan stars, because that is in uh, the constellation uh, between Aquila and Aphucus, and that will be uh, visible roughly about magnitude uh, 10. Just in case you're interested in, in cometary detail. But if you want a minor planet, you want planet minor planet 10 Hygieia, and that's in the planet in the constellation of Virgo. That's a that's an interesting one. It was located between Jupiter and, and Mars, thinking it was a missing planet, but uh, it's 270 miles uh, wide and is relatively spherical. So that's why they thought it was a, a, a missing planet, but obviously uh, was not to be. So that's just a few uh, highlights of this week's forthcoming events, if you're interested. Thank you very much. Right, thank you, Roger. And uh, next, uh, we come over to Lou. Lou, I, I gather you've got some stuff for us this week. Lou? Oh, Lou's currently not communicating. There we go. There ah, we go. fantastic. Here over to you, Lou. <laughs> Uh, well, a few things, I guess. Um, uh, let's let's start off with the Artemis program. So we're going back to the moon. We're going to send people back, and we're going to stay there. That's that's the goal of the Artemis program. Uh, and as we do this, as we develop our Auto Artemis uh, rocket and the space launch vehicle, and uh, work on getting people there, we want to find out more about the moon, more about the science of the moon. So there is a, um, a second call for uh, lunar instruments that will set down on the lunar surface and provide uh, uh, information on the physical state of the moon. And that was just approved for two new instruments. Uh, one is called PRISM, the uh, uh, Payload Research Investigations on the Surface of the Moon. People stay up late at night figuring out these acronyms. This is where all, <laughs> this is where all the space money goes. Um, and uh, this uh, instrument suite will uh, have a uh, uh, couple of uh, instruments. Uh, we'll have the um, Lunar Vice, the Vulcan Imaging and Spectroscopy Experiment, not planet Vulcan, but volcanology. Uh, so this is going to uh, look at, um, with, a, with a lander and a rover, it's going to look at uh, extinct lunar volcanoes, uh, with a specific emphasis on Grutheson domes, which is a kind of a, um, a sticky lava, uh, silicate-rich uh, volcano. Think of, think of uh, granite uh, on the earth, and it will be uh, uh, investigating the physical properties of that extinct volcano. The second one is the Lunar Explorer Instrument for Space Biology Applications, LEIA, L-E-I-A. And this is actually just a CubeSat that's going to sit down on the moon and it has yeast in it. Now, what could be more exciting than that? Uh, but this yeast has uh, enough um, uh, similarities uh, with um, uh, human DNA and its ability to react to and, and at times repair broken DNA from radiation environments but they want to see how this yeast does uh, both in the high radiation environment of the moon and the low gravity of the moon. So that's the second experiment uh, that, will, that has just been approved. So all of these things are going to be supplied by commercial lunar payload services. And uh, that's for um, these uh, instruments and others for the next decade of lunar exploration. Shall I go on? Yes, please do. <laughs> Um, I thought it would be fun to, um, uh, you know, I have a, a undergraduate uh, class back uh, here in the United States, and um, uh, it's often uh, kind of hard to teach concepts of where you are and where things are in the universe. So uh, I have them uh, do a little experiment at times um, to um, build uh, a Mariner's Astrolabe. Now, I've got one here that I've um, actually completed. This is a um, little compass here with a straw tape to the top and a weight uh, hanging on the end of a string. And this is a, this is a poor man's version of what the um, 
uh, early uh, mariners before there was GPS and uh, other things like that used to tell their latitude on earth. Uh, I just went down to the um, Grand Cayman Islands. I just got back this weekend and uh, they are located south of Cuba and I live in Maryland. So my, my latitude is about 39 degrees and I was at 19 degrees in Grand Cayman. And what I noticed as I looked out at the night sky is the North Star was lower in the sky. And, it, and this is a, all a byproduct of the round earth. So if you have friends that come to you, ask, hey, is the earth flat, which we were hearing a little too much of, um, uh, at least back here in the United States, um, you can uh, explain to them, it's a very simple, there's a very simple way to, to show there's a round earth. So you build one of these, lunar, one of these uh, mariners astrolabes and you just let the string hang down, just like that, with the weight on the end. And then you sight the North Star through the straw. And you'll notice that as you do that, the position of the string along this graduated semicircle here changes. And from that, you can get your latitude. If you're looking, if you're at the North Pole, the North Star is straight up and your latitude is 90 degrees. If you are at the equator, you'll sight the North Star like this right on the horizon and your latitude is zero. So this is a very easy way to, if you're ever kidnapped and flown somewhere, you'll be able to know exactly what your latitude is by building one of these. Just ask your kidnappers, tell them you need one of these things. Um, so it's a fun experiment you can do if you're an astronomy educator or if you just um, wanna have a family science night and um, uh, need, need, a, need a fun activity. I'd like to say something about that, Lou, if I may. You, you sort of mentioned about your latitude. Um, uh, I'm about 51, 52 degrees where I live. Um, and when I went to uh, Florida um, in December 2018, I noticed I was able to look at the look at Orion. And I noticed the difference in the actual angular size of Orion compared when what it is here, it was just incredible. Not only the height above the, you know, the, above the horizon, but the actual angular um, size of the Orion itself. Well, now that's interesting. <laughs> that, um, we, we do see things uh, uh, in the sky that uh, where things appear larger and smaller. For example, the mm. moon on the horizon looks larger. It's mm. not really. In fact, it's in fact it's further away than when it's straight above you, mm. or, or close to straight above you. Um, but uh, a larger angular size for Orion. Now, I haven't I haven't heard that, about that because mm. it was um, it was um, lower in the sky than it is here. Perhaps it's here. Was... You see, oh. so um, that's why. Yeah, it's one thing I certainly noticed when I was there. Well, as a, as a, as a good scientist, uh, I know you can um, take your um, simulation software like Stellarium or whatever you're mm. using and, and do the actual measurements. But I, yeah, that's true. I, I'd be shocked if, if, that were the, if that were the case, I would want to talk to you about. <laughs> you like to yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. I've just realized looking around the panel that I might be the most northerly just at about 53 degrees. Okay. Something like that between Liverpool and Manchester. I don't know if yeah. anybody can can beat that. Bernard, maybe no. Uh, and I think Lou is probably the most southerly. Did you say thirty nine degrees, Lou? Yes. Ah, uh, you beat me. I'm. I'm. Um, I, I'm uh, no, I beat you. We're actually forty one. So okay, uh, that's right. You're a little little further. Mm. And with all these, see, with all these people at different latitudes, you we could we could replicate the Eratosthenes experiment. We could, couldn't we? Right. That, that's a that's a thought, isn't it? We ought to do that. That sounds like work. You put a stick in the ground and measure the angle of the shadow. It's, that's, yeah. that's out of work. Yeah, that's good. Uh, that that would be a lovely experiment to reproduce. Okay. Yeah. Is is that all you've got for us this week, Lou? Oh, I have tons more. I just. Oh, uh, right. Well, we'll go, should we come back to you for the moment? Because yeah, yeah. I know Mary is right. absolutely busting to tell us about noctilucent clouds. Yeah. <laughs> isn't that right, Mary? Yes. Absolutely. 
um, yeah, the probably one of my favorite things to see. And I always say, if you're not sure whether you've seen them or not, you probably haven't because you know. Um, I'm just going to share my screen because I'm, there's a few things I want to tell you about them. First of all, noctilucent is means night shining. So it literally translates as night shining clouds. And that's what they do. They look like they're shining out through the twilight sky. And they're a kind of polar mesospheric cloud, which means they're right up on the edge of space and they accumulate around the poles. Um, they're only visible during the summer months. So for us in the Northern Hemisphere, that's right now. The season has kicked off. If you are in the Southern Hemisphere, it'll be during your summer months. And they only become visible in deep twilight. So it's like about an hour after the sun has set or 90 minutes after the sun sets and before the sun rises. So once we get into the middle of June, basically they can be visible all night long. So they're incredibly antisocial. They mean I spend mm. most of my summer extremely sleep deprived because I sit up all night looking for these things. But they're really interesting because they were never recorded before 1885. And they are on the rise. So the strong theory is that it's connected to global warming, and I'll explain why in a second. So first of all, just to give you some context, when we talk about mesospheric clouds, cirrus clouds are the highest clouds we have in our troposphere, excluding supercell thunder clouds that go higher. And these clouds, cirrus clouds, are what give us ice halos and sun dogs and stuff like that. But noctilucent clouds are right up on the border between the mesosphere and thermosphere, which is basically the edge of space. Um, so they're only kind of 20 kilometers below the, the bottom edge of Aurora. So they're really, really high. Um, but they accumulate around the North Pole. So you would think, how can we see them from anywhere other than the North Pole? And it's because of how high they are. So even from kind of most of the UK, actually, and sometimes if you're really lucky down into mainland Europe, if you look to the north in twilight, you will see these clouds, hopefully. So the reason they're not visible during the day is down to ice crystal size. And this is mind blowing. So the ice crystals, the hexagonal ice crystals that give us ice halos are 0.1 millimeters in size. So this black or this blue box with the black edge here is 0.1 millimeters. So that's small. The size of a noctilucent cloud ice crystal is that dot there relative to that. So it hits 0.1 microns across. So they're really, really tiny. So when they reflect sunlight back down, um, you don't see them in daytime because there's too much light in the lower levels of the atmosphere. Now, the way that they form is also very interesting and still stuff we don't fully understand, but you need a source of water, first of all, and the mesosphere is very dry. And the reason for that is that UV from the sun breaks down water. And that means that when we have more solar activity, there tends to be less likelihood that there'll be water there in order for the crystals to form. But you also need a nucleus at the center of that crystal, which would, is micrometeorite dust. And like we're talking so small that it would be right at the center and even smaller than that 0.1 micron thing that we're looking at here. So there were some theories about volcanic dust because a few about three or four years before they were first reported there was a massive eruption in Mount Krakatoa which sent a lot of volcanic ash up into the upper atmosphere um, it could be that but I think generally the consensus is that it's micrometeorite dust so they're really really beautiful and it, they are visible usually kind of between I'm trying to remember off the top of my head um, which latitude it is. Um, I thought it was on the slide, but it's not. <laughs> um, it's a 45 to 60 degrees. That's it. So between 45 and 60 degrees latitude is where you're likely to see these. If you're any further north, it doesn't get dark enough because the sun has to be between 6 and 16 degrees below the horizon. When it's there, the lower levels of atmosphere are completely in shadow, but these clouds are so high that they're still getting sunlight, which is why they have this glowing quality about them. So you tend to see them, if you are further north than um, 
than that kind of range, it doesn't get dark enough. So if you are actually at the North Pole, you're not going to see these clouds, even though they're essentially above your head. Now, they can actually extend over a huge amount of your horizon. I've seen them 120 degrees of horizon with not too lucent clouds on them. After sunset, they tend to be more in the northwest because obviously that's the side of the sky that the sun is on. But sometimes you can get bits of like the kind of panoramic picture here you can get bits of cloud anywhere along the horizon there sometimes you get it across the whole horizon and other times like before dawn it tends to be more towards the east and i always see better not to lucent cloud displays in the east before sunrise they're always better than the after sunset ones i don't know why that is so they have lots of different sorts of structure and no two displays are ever really exactly the same but you can see they have this bluish white color mostly but you can get red ones as well this bottom picture here was taken a couple of years ago with comet neowise in shot as well just absolutely beautiful they can resemble ripples they look like water waves that they're just unbelievably beautiful and i believe this was the remains of a noctilucent cloud tornado which is a quite an, an awesome thing as well so if you are a little bit further north in the uk you will see these a little bit higher but you, they're generally quite low in the northern horizon the further south you are the lower to the horizon the clouds will be and obviously unless you get a really brilliant display that goes up beyond the zenith from the uk you may see them in mainland europe as well um so yeah they're very very beautiful very mysterious and they make the most incredible time lapse subject i had to include this picture taken by my friend stephen cheatley because what doesn't make any picture better than having a roller coaster in the foreground but this is such a beautiful display and you can see that because he's in blackpool he's got that much more of the sky filled with noctilucent clouds um, I've got a little time lapse to just show you here. They move in a very different way from tropospheric clouds. They, they're just gorgeous. I mean, I, I can't emphasize enough how beautiful they are. My husband just rolls his eyes because I'm obsessed with these things. And, you know, I'm happily going to set my alarm for 1.30 in the morning to get up to try to look for them. But I've got a close up bit of this video here to, to just show you what they look like up close. And they are really, really pretty. So if you do get an opportunity to photograph them, just keep your camera in one place and keep taking photos because getting a time lapse like this is just gorgeous. Now, there's one thing that can help you with your observations, if you set an alarm for 1.30, before you get out of bed and look out of the window, go to the Not So Lucent Cloud webcam pages and the links to both of those sites are in the description box, hopefully. And basically the parts of Europe that are an hour ahead of us you will see on the webcams pointing north whether there are any noctilucent clouds visible. If there are, then it's worth getting out of bed. If there's nothing showing on the webcams, then I just go back to sleep now. I used to just go and camp out in a field for the whole night just in case, but you know, I kind of value my sleep a little bit more these days. So you can see they are really pretty. They're they're just really mesmerizing to watch. They look incredible through binoculars. One thing that will help you as well is on Twitter, there is an account called NLC Alerts and one called NLC Net. Both of those will post if people are actively seeing displays and people within the community of observers will hashtag NLC Now. So you can go to Twitter or other social media platforms and just see if other people are reporting the clouds because if they are, there'll be a good chance that you'll get them too. And don't forget, like with all astronomy, submit your observations to the BAA because this is, these are a type of thing that are still relatively new in terms of how frequently they've been seen because most weather events have been reported since the kind of well dawn of time essentially but not to lucent clouds haven't been around that long so we need more information on them and kind of gauge how they're forming how they're evolving and how they link with solar activity because the more active the sun is the more uv there'll be the more water gets broken down and such like so we need to kind of submit our findings on this and help people learn more about them so good luck looking for them um yeah i turn into golem during the summer because i'm not asleep very much but they're worth it <laughs> they, they certainly are mary thank you so much for that all of mary's links and information you will find in the uh, description of this video look underneath that and and it's all there um 
I've got Noctilucent Clouds and Aurori on the bucket list of things that I want to see before I die. Uh, I've never seen either. And living here, I'm not likely to see either. <laughs> so, so, uh, so there we are. I'm far too far south. But you never know. You said that uh, it's possible. It's possible I may see Noctilucent Clouds, but it would have to be a damn good showing of them. <laughs> okay, Mary, thanks for that, sorry, Mary. So, sorry, just a quick question. Mary, you say they happen in the, uh, the Northern Hemisphere. Do they happen in the Southern Hemisphere as well? They do, yeah. Um, they're not reported as frequently, mostly because there just isn't as much habitated landmass in the southern hemisphere. Um, mm. They tend to have quite weird seasons down there, but they do form around the South Pole. And there is a satellite, that picture I showed you of the daisy, that is actual satellite pictures that show the accumulation. And there's one that covers the south during their summer months so it's only really in the UK from mid-May through to mid-August is our season um, there is also a link to an in-depth article on NLCs on my own website which I think is in the description and that will tell you the period of time that it's visible in the southern hemisphere. Okay thank you for that. Right. I have a question as well um, Mary I'm Thanks so much. I'm really excited, actually. I don't think I've ever seen a uh, Noctilucent cloud before. What, um, could you recommend the best time to view them? Obviously, in summer, you were mentioning 1.30 in the morning. Like, that's really late at night. Is um, there... Yeah, it really, it has to be when the sun gets less than six degrees below the horizon. So from about an hour after sunset or right. an hour before sunrise. So in midsummer, that is incredibly antisocial. You just don't go to bed because they can stay visible all night long. But at either end of the season, you're more likely to get one that's a bit closer to dawn and still have time for some sleep. But yeah, you need to be out really at those times because that's when the sun's low enough that the lower level is in atmosphere, but the clouds are high enough to still get the light. So yeah, they are really antisocial. Um, I'm quite grumpy most of the summer because I don't get enough sleep. Um, great. Thanks for that. And then viewers, if you have any questions, uh, you know, about anything that we're, we're discussing, so I don't hesitate to put them in the chat and we will do our very best to, to answer them. Also, of course, I'd ask you to like and subscribe. Uh, the more subscriptions we have, the more we're able to do with our fledgling channel so please do subscribe and uh, hit the like button and also hit the notification button and you'll be notified of any new videos that we post which we hope in the future will not just include these live shows but other videos that we make as well so your subscriptions are much valued and, and thank you very much okay let's go back to lou for a while and then uh, then we'll, we'll ask uh, uh, bernard what he's got for us this week okay Let's, uh, as long as we have uh, noctilucent clouds scattering sunlight, um, let's talk about the sun a little bit. Uh, one of the um, uh, events that happened just recently is that the Parker Solar Probe, named after Eugene Parker, who first postulated the solar wind, Parker Solar Probe has uh, completed its 12th perihelion passage. So this is a spacecraft, this is a remarkable spacecraft that, um, as NASA talks about it, it, was built to touch the sun. It's traveling closer to the sun than anything else that we have ever sent. Uh, roughly uh, one-tenth the distance uh, from the sun as Mercury. So uh, it makes these very wide eccentric passes very close to the sun and then very far out uh, right around the orbit of uh, Venus. And uh, as it's out, uh, as it's close to the sun, it takes measurements of the solar wind, of uh, solar activity. And as it comes out uh, to the orbit of uh, Venus, then it's able to transmit its data back to Earth. The sun is a tremendous radio source, so you're not going to get much uh, signal if you're transmitting from a region near the sun. So it goes all the way out to Venus, sends its data and goes back in for more. This is a remarkable instrument uh, in, many ways because um, one of them is that it has a heat shield that is constantly pointed at the sun to keep the instruments on board at, you know, roughly room temperature. So that is an amazing feat when you're talking about uh, being just a few million miles from the solar surface. And Parker Solar Probe, along with, by the way, the European Solar Orbiter, were built to answer some very fundamental questions about the sun. Uh, things that we are, are just mesmerized about. 
why is the corona so hot? Why when you move out from the sun, off the photosphere, through the chromosphere, do temperatures rise? It makes no sense. You move away from a fire, you, it gets less and less hot. Not so with the sun. What is the energy source that is causing that? And what is the energy source that powers the solar wind and solar storms? Solar storms uh, uh, can uh, make it from the surface of the sun to the earth in a matter of just a couple, uh, a couple of days. What's the energy source for that? Parker Solar Probe is built to collect the data to uh, get an answer to those questions. And speaking of the sun, <laughs> Speaking of the sun, if I can unshare for a second and then reshare, see if I can. Let's see what I want. I want this. Okay. Speaking of the sun, the sun, as um, many of you know, goes through cycles. Uh, there are a number of cycles. The best known is the 11 year sunspot cycle, which uh, has the sun every 11 years and then half a cycle later, uh, not very active, not as many sunspots. We're moving right up towards solar maximum at this point. So we're going to start to see a lot of coronal mass ejections, solar flares, more sunspots if you're a solar observer. We seem to be losing, lose audio there. You still here? Yeah, you're cutting out a bit on the audio though, Lou. Okay. Um, how, how is it now? Better now, try again. All right. Please do continue. Uh, so one way you can keep an eye on solar activity is by looking at the planetary K index, the KP index. And this is a uh, collection of magnetometers registering the Earth's magnetic field around the planet. And when you put their information together, you get a sense for how much the Earth's magnetic field is being pushed or moved as a coronal mass ejection, for example, can do, right? We know that um, these particles streaming out from the sun have magnetic fields associated with them because they're charged particles. They're carrying a part of the sun's magnetic field with them and they plow into the Earth's magnetic field and move it. And so that the degree of deflection is measured in the KP index. And I have a picture of the, a plot of the KP index that you would see if you just Googled it and, um, and kept, kept track of solar activity. The, um, the index goes from zero to nine and uh, it's color coded. So anything in green means that um, the sun's pretty quiescent today, not much going on. But occasionally, when there's a solar storm and the Earth's magnetic field is deflected, you will see these rise to four or five, six or, six, or perhaps more, and the colors will change to yellow and red, indicating not just strong solar activity, but a um, uh, greater chance of seeing aurora, right? And we know that um, uh, we can see aurora near the poles frequently, but as the solar activity increases and you have more powerful uh, CMEs striking the Earth's magnetosphere, uh, you can see auroral activity down for, uh, 40 degrees, maybe, maybe lower, this kind of thing. Usually in the lower latitudes, it's registered as a red haze on the northern um, or, or on the horizon where you would see the sun. And um, this is uh, at times has been uh, mistaken for fires in the distance. So they're pretty cool to watch. And the KP index will tell you whether it's a good idea to go out and start looking for Aurora. Great, thank you so Can much. I just say that for people in the UK, I live in North Oxfordshire and I have photographed Aurora from here 16 to 17 times in the last eight years. So it's worth keeping an eye on that KP index because it happens more frequently at mid latitudes than people realize. And if, if our listeners, if our viewers do want to uh, keep an eye on that index, Lou, where can they find it? Well, uh, this is this, this website that I had up here was the Space Weather Prediction Center. Uh, it is uh, from NOAA, the National Oceanographic Atmospheric Administration. And um, 
Uh, they keep track of solar activity because it's uh, important, well, for a variety of reasons, including, by the way, uh, national defense. Solar storms can uh, affect spacecraft, they yeah, can affect sure. power sure. systems, and all of the, all of the, um, uh, Net, you know, what you might call negative impacts uh, besides beautiful aurora. So if our viewers just search for NOAA, that's N-O-A-A-A, -A -A, uh, they'll uh, find it. Two A's. Is it two A's? National Oceanographic oh, yes, and Atmospheric right. Administration. That's right. It's, it must be thinking of something else. Yes, N-O-A-A -A, and uh, Google on that and, and you'll definitely find it. Okay. Um, you've got some more for us, no doubt, Lou. So uh, we'll come back to that, if we may. Sure. Uh, Bernard, what have you got for us this week? Yeah, hi. So um, I actually wanted to go back to um, to what was uh, discussed slightly last week with regards to JWST, James Webb Space Telescope, and the uh, and the uh, the exoplanet observation programs that it has in mind. And uh, I just wanted to, I'm going to share my screen here. Um, because there's something really exciting happening, and I just wanted to uh, reiterate this uh, one more time. So let me share my screen. Can you all see this? Yes, that's there. Yeah, okay. So, um, so JWST has a, has a, what we call cycles, and there these are basically twelve month observation periods, and we're going to start the first cycle. Um, and um, the exciting thing is that you know J JWST, of course, you know has been designed to observe the really distant objects like the uh, the first galaxies and such, but it also has uh, the capability to observe exoplanets in in uh, in exquisite detail, um, and that's uh, from a spectrometry spectrometry point of view. And I just wanted to reiterate the fact that. Um, you know, there's going to be 95 observational programs of exoplanets uh, in the coming year. That's quite significant. Um, 25 are actually guaranteed uh, uh, time observation and 70 are general observation. That means that uh, within the JWST program, the uh, the, the teams uh, that were in charge of designing the instruments and, and such uh, had a guaranteed time program and they were able to select exactly what they wanted to see. But that's, those are the 25 ones. and. And the 70 general observation programs are all the different uh, proposals that were submitted through the last years, through the many years, uh, as we were waiting for JWST to, to get online. And, um, and, uh, and, and, you know, all these proposals, you know, um, uh, are uh, going, to, going to make JWST look at uh, over 100 exoplanets uh, within this year. And... Um, the first exoplanets going to be imaged are going to be uh, sort of like they're going to try and do some dry runs. And um, so basically they've commissioned the instruments, but before they're actually going to go and look at the exoplanets within those observational programs, they want to, they just want to test things out. So they're, they're going to look at some um, Jupiter sized planets, some big gas giants and, uh, and other types of uh, exoplanets. And these are the five ones that I've listed below. And then once they're confident in their abilities to start to observe exoplanets, they're going to go ahead and do so. Um, and one really exciting thing, and we've talked about it last week, but I wanted to, to, to dive into it a little bit more, is the TRAPPIST-1 system. Now, we've all heard of the TRAPPIST-1 system, this uh, seven terrestrial planet system that's 39 light years away from us. Um, it's orbiting, uh, these uh, exoplanets are orbiting a uh, uh, red dwarf. And it's exciting because, you know, seven Earth-like planets uh, in terms of their size and, and the fact that they're rocky. And um, we know, of course, that uh, some of those are within the habitable zone. Uh, so we, we, we label these planets B, C, D, E, F, G, and H. And uh, we believe that E, F, and G are sitting within the habitable zone of that system. As a reminder, the habitable zone is the area where we believe it's not too hot and it's not too cold um, in order to, to be able to have liquid water uh, on the surface of those, of those planetary bodies. Now, it's not, um, it, it doesn't imply that there is liquid water. It's just that uh, it, liquid water could potentially uh, occur on the surface. And of course, if there is liquid water, then the increase of likelihood of, of, of life you know, uh, goes up. So what's really exciting about 
about the TRAPPIST-1 system is the fact that it's going to be the uh, only exoplanet system that's going to be observed multiple times um, throughout the year. It has four observation programs. Um, I believe it's the, the exoplanet system that has the most observation programs by the GWST. So um, this is system is going to be studied in, 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 in significant detail. And I've, I've listed here, I've made this small table that shows us throughout the year, the different transits that uh, JWST is going to observe. Now, again, let's remind ourselves that JWST does not have the capacity to, to provide high resolution images of a planet, of an exoplanet. It's just the planets are just too small and too distant, but it will be able to do something which is really exciting called uh, transit spectroscopy, where basically, it breaks down the light of the, of the star that passes through the atmosphere or the hypothetical atmosphere of a planet. And it can actually break down that light and, and, and allow us to characterize, uh, to determine what are the different gases uh, of, you know, that's, that uh, constitute the atmosphere. Now, and it is important also for us to re remember that we actually don't know if any of these exoplanets within the TRAPPIST system have atmospheres. Uh, JWST is going to start to study them. And, uh, and if they do have atmospheres, we're going to be able to detect them through these transits as the exoplanet pass near the star. Um, and an interesting thing is that also it's going to do eclipses and that's where the exoplanet uh, goes behind the star and by doing so we can also measure the uh, the daylight uh, temperature of the planet so we're going with the transits we're going to be able to measure the the night temperature of the planet and the e eclipses we're going to be able to measure the daylight temperature and therefore we're going to be able to determine as well if there are any movements of the atmosphere uh, throughout throughout one of their days if there is an atmosphere. The reason why this is exciting is that if there is life on one of those exoplanets um, and if uh, JWST will, will have hopefully the capability of detecting this life, um, well, sorry, detecting the biosignatures of this life, if this life, you know, does produce some type of a gas um, that might be able to, uh, we might be able to pick up that gas within the atmosphere, uh, depending on the concentration of that gas and the nature of the gas. And, uh, and this is happening now. Um, the JWST, I know that uh, some of the first observations are starting this month. Uh, and of course, it's going to take many months to uh, for the for the data to be, uh, you know, reviewed and then and then published. Um, so, um, so maybe now, uh, you know, as we speak, JWST is observing one of those TRAPPIST-1 exoplanets. And, and if there is an atmosphere, it's going to be able to uh, characterize that atmosphere. And if there is potential life on that exoplanet and, and, and life is, is, in, uh, is in quantity sufficient enough to be able to, to change uh, that atmosphere, we might be able to pick it up. Um, so... We live in extraordinary times, and uh, and and, uh, and 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 I think I, this is just this is just remarkable that we now are able to we might be able to uh, at some point look at the world news, you know, and this might be the headline news, uh, a spectrograph, you know, of an atmosphere. Now, will most of the people understand what this means? I you know I don't know, <laughs> but. Uh, but uh, you know, it's it's going to be amazing. So I, I just wanted. To, I know we've discussed about it last week, but I just wanted to to put some more some more coloring context around uh, around this event. So there we go. Thank you very much, Bernard. Fantastic. Okay, well, I've got a little uh, treat for you now. Um, I've got news of an astronomical prediction that is uh, very specific and quite amazing. So uh, just let me uh, share my screen. And, uh, and I will tell you all about it. So basically, this is all about um, supermassive black hole emerges. And can everybody see that? Yeah. OK, that's great. So there's an there's a interesting prediction about a particular merger of two supermassive black holes that I'd like to tell you about. But let's back up a little bit before we do so. Now, the first one I'd like to tell you about um, is an object called NGC1128. 
Now, this was a, it's a, it's a galaxy about 300 million light years away. It was um, added to the new general catalog, the, NG, the famous NGC catalog of objects, by an astronomer called Lewis Swift in 1886. And he noted that it had a uh, peculiar dumbbell shape, uh, which, of course, nobody at the time could really explain. Well, we now know that, in fact, uh, as you can probably guess from looking at this image, it's not one galaxy, but two. It's two galaxies that are merging. So we are looking at a, a galactic merger, two galaxies that have come together and, uh, and are merging with a process, incidentally, which will happen to our own galaxy and the Andromeda galaxy in about three billion years time and uh, three or four billion years time. So we won't be here to see it. The effect of that galactic merger um, can vary depending on the masses of the galaxies, but essentially the two galaxies pass straight through each other without uh, much else happening. There may be stars that collide, but that will be very rare because of the vastness of space. There may be stars that are gravitationally swung out of their own galaxy by interactions with other stars. And we've observed some of these, uh, these lone planets orbiting without a galaxy uh, to belong to, poor things. Um, so anything could happen. But the interesting thing about NGC 1128 is what happens when you look at it with an X-ray telescope. And if you look at it with an X-ray telescope, like the famous NASA Chandra telescope, this is actually what you see. You see two very, very bright X-ray sources. And what astronomers believe we're looking at are the two black holes from their respective galaxies that have been attracted to each other and are co-orbiting, they're orbiting around each other. The disk of material surrounding them has, has heated up so much that it generates these incredibly bright X-rays. Um, but even more interestingly, when you look at it with a radio telescope, so we're looking at radio light now, not X-ray light, something else appears. And these immense jets that the black holes are shooting out across uh, space appear at radio wavelengths. And um, this is incredible. The scale of this is quite unbelievable. Um, but suffice to say, do you notice that the jets are not straight like many other um, jets shooting out of black holes that we see? They're sort of swept back. Now, this is because this, uh, the NGC 1128 galaxy, which we now know to be two galaxies, is in the middle of a cluster of galaxies called Abel 400. And there's a lot of hot gas in that cluster. And NGC 1128 is moving through the cluster at about 12 million miles an hour. And the interaction with the hot gas is pushing against these jets, forcing them to be swept back. So that represents the motion of, the, the, of NGC 1128 through the cluster, amazingly. Let's take a closer look because those two black holes are separated by 25,000 light years. They look close together, but they're not. And uh, I've put in there the number of miles that is. Uh, so they are really, really, really not close at all. But they are co-orbiting, and it's thought that they will merge into one larger black hole sometime in the next few million years. Um, so this is, this is, uh, these, are, these are black holes in action, which will merge into one uh, bigger black hole. Um, when two black holes merge, you don't take the mass of each black hole, add them together, and that ends up the mass of the resulting black hole it's always less than the sum of the two because the rest of that energy is radiated away, the rest of that energy or mass, if you like, because they are equivalent, it's radiated away in the form of gravitational waves. So you don't always get the sum of the, the parts, if you like. Now, another one uh, that I want to talk about is this object PKS uh, 2131021. This is what's called a blazar. Now, with a blazar, it's the same type of idea. You've got an active galactic nucleus. The nucleus of the galaxies is really active because the black hole is, is feeding, so to speak. Um, 
And the, the jet, one of those jets that we saw in the previous uh, example, is pointing straight at us, or more or less straight at us. And when it does that, that object is known as a blazar, believe it or not. So a blazar is an active galactic nucleus where one of the jets is pointing more or less straight at us. Now, what astronomers noted, um, by the way, this is 9.1 billion light years away we're looking. This is a, a simulation done at Caltech. Uh, what, what they noticed was that the uh, jet was moving around. It was describing a circle. And the only explanation they have for that is if there is another black hole that is not active, that is co-orbiting, as you see in the animation, forcing the, the black hole with the, the active nucleus um, to uh, uh, generating this jet to point straight at us. And this, these two black holes are reckoned to merge in about 10,000 years. So that's, uh, that's quite sooner than uh, 3C75, the previous example. Another one is NGC 6240, another one in the new general catalog. And uh, this has got a sort of a butterfly shape, but again, it's an example of two merging galaxies giving the object this irregular shape. And if you look at the center of this one in X-rays, again, uh, we see two supermassive black holes, uh, highly visible in X-rays that are co-orbiting and will merge together into one black hole. Uh, there's no estimate with this one about, uh, about when that's going to happen. They don't have enough data, but it's going to happen uh, because these are definitely co-orbiting. And, and finally, to come back to the prediction that I mentioned earlier, um, is this object, which is known as Active Galaxy SD SSJ1430 plus 2303. If you're wondering what all the numbers are, it's just its coordinates on the sky, its celestial coordinates. Now, this one is a bit special because, again, we've got two supermassive black holes. Here's, here's a simulated picture of them there that are generating vast quantities of X-rays. And what astronomers have noticed is that there's a pattern to these X-rays which indicates that the two black holes are going to merge very soon. Now, when I say very soon, I'm not talking in normal astronomical terms. I'm talking, they say within the next 300 days. So we could be seeing a merger of two supermassive black holes. Uh, the, the date range they gave was June the 5th to the, uh, to the next 300 days. And they say this could happen. What happens when it does, if and when it does, we will see a gigantic burst of X-rays uh, as predicted um, and all sorts of other, uh, hopefully lots of really strong radio emissions and other EM radiation as well. So we could be in for a bit of a treat within the next 300 days um, when these two black holes merge. I should point out, however, that that is only one interpretation of the X-ray data. There are astronomers who are saying, no, it's not that, it's something else, it could be this, it could be this. But if this is the explanation, at the moment it looks fairly plausible. We could be in for, uh, it's only, only inverted commas, 1.2 billion light years away. So we could be in for uh, a ringside seat for the merger of two supermassive black holes, which would be quite, should be quite spectacular. So there you have it, the merger of uh, two uh, supermassive black holes. Uh, interesting stuff, as always. And um, who do we go over to now? I think, uh, Michael, you had something for us uh, today, didn't you? Yes, I have. Um, and if you would... Uh, hang on a second. I'm just going to share my screen. Okay. <clears throat> okay. You see that's okay? Uh, yeah, ah, yes, this is yes. the Chinese launch. <clears throat> yes, and um, just to bring uh, everyone down to earth, as it were, a um, couple of launches of note um, on uh, Friday, uh, two launches on Friday. The first one, a um, major one, really, that's uh, China launched the uh, three-person Shenzhou uh, 14 crew to the Tiangong space station for a six-month stay. They docked just uh, over seven hours later. Uh, which is a, a, a good uh, uh, feat as well. Um, and uh, the thing with the, uh, this particular crew, they are going to get the uh, space station ready for a permanently uh, crewed um, 
station over the next six months. Uh, when the crew is expected to be replaced by another three person crew on Chensu 15. So, not only will we have the um, International Space Station uh, permanently crewed, uh, we will also have the uh, Chinese Space Station uh, permanently crewed uh, towards the end of the year. Um, not sure how many um, of our audience know about the Chinese. Uh, uh, space Station program, but I think everybody would know about the uh, ISS. Uh, it's interesting to see that we have a, another space station uh, in orbit. Uh, Michael, is that the same space station that Sandra Bullock went to? And is that the one in, in the movie Gravity? Is that the same? No, no, this is this was only a fairly recent launch, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, about, a year, about a year ago, was it launched? I think something like that. Yeah, that's right. Because that one, that one took a, a pounding, as I remember. Ah, oh, yes, indeed. Right, yes. okay, yeah. That's good to know. So, that's that. a very nice bit of the to launch anyway, <laughs> the Chinese uh, rockies. Um, so just another, another uh, um, a launch uh, on the opposite end of the scale, if you like. Uh, the uh, Blue Origin uh, New Shepard rockets uh, also launched on um, Friday to the edge of space. Mm. Uh, which, we, which we will stop there. We won't discuss that any further. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. but, um, this was the uh, 21st mission of the um, the, the, the rocket and uh, the uh, fifth uh, human space flight mission. Um, uh, the crew of uh, six, uh, uh, you can see it in the crew there, and, and then I on the next. Um, I won't attempt to... Uh, to Pronounce some of them, some of those either. <laughs> and basically, that's all I have to say about the you know, current um, space flight. Um, well, the, the, thank you very much, Michael. I mean, the, the Chinese are making leaps and bounds in, yeah. in space. They they have uh, consciously uh, accelerated their whole space program. Yeah. And they've got lots of things planned for their space station. They're launching a telescope uh, into Earth orbit as well, a space telescope. Right. Um, I can't remember exactly when, but but sometime in the near future, they plan to launch a, yeah. I think it was not a big space telescope, a 14-inch, I think, space telescope, something like that. Uh, they, and, of course, they're, they're planning to beat everybody to the moon. So, That's right, yeah. uh, you know, I wouldn't be at all surprised. Um, yeah, yes, Daz. Um, I was just thinking, you were talking about them launching a uh, telescope. Well, of course, on there is it Chengi 4 um, rover on the moon. They've mm. got an infrared telescope on. They have indeed. Right, yes. That's yes. Right. And they, they thought they would be out of uh, sight of the Earth, um, so it won't be affected by any um, radio noise, um, and they'll be able to get some really lovely images, which they should be able to. But unfortunately, the rover itself that it's mounted on creates so much radio noise, it doesn't work properly. So <laughs> they've got that one wrong, unfortunately. Oh, dear. Yes, um, Whoops, um, whoops. But of course, as regards space stations as well, we've got another two in the making. We've got the Axiom, yeah, the Axiom space one, yeah. station that uh, should be start being uh, created next year. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that should be also followed by the um, Orbital, uh, Orbital Reef. Reef, which is, yeah, that's uh, right. of course, um, mm. uh, Jeff Bezos and uh, Blue Origins. And, yeah, uh, looking forward to that one. Yeah, that yeah, so should be good. By the way, I've just, checked, I've just checked the... Um, the Chinese space telescope. I was wrong. It's launching next year, by the way. The Chinese okay. space telescope. Yeah. And it's it's a, a two meter aperture, two meter telescope. So, wow. So I mean, uh, yeah. So, so, don't don't forget they, they now lay claim to the largest uh, Earth based radio telescope. They do until oh, right. the square kilometer array. Um, Darn impolite, I think, of them to be doing all this. Can <laughs> 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 I just make a point about the um, uh, the the uh, Blue Origin launch. Yeah. Yes, it's a, a short trip of only a few minutes worth of weightlessness. But the more launches they do, the more private people they take up will bring prices down in the future for gentle space flight in general, I think, uh, and make it accessible for um, more ordinary people, if you like. Yeah, were those all billionaires in that picture that you showed? Those... Probably. Um, Usually probably. Is. I, don't, I yeah. don't have that information. <laughs> yeah. I, and, you know, you'd like to think these people will return a bit changed from the experience mm. and become space advocates. So mm. from that point of view, perhaps it's a good thing because the more people we have advocating, the better, obviously. 
Mm. Um, but on the other hand, this thing about oh, it'll all, it'll be available to uh, normal folk like like us. Well, uh, yeah. at a reasonable price, I think it's a load of nonsense. Well, not in the foreseeable future, anyway. No, that's right. Um, you know, uh, it, it will happen one day. It'll, you know, space travel will become as common as getting on a bus or a train, and probably mm. about the same level of expenditure one day. Uh, but that yeah, with, time with, is, is with still the, far um, off. With the advent of all these commercial companies doing various levels of space flight, it's got mm. to come cheaper for, in the long run for. And it will. Um, I mean, you look, you look at the first days of, for example, transatlantic aviation. Yeah. Uh, and don't forget that was started by the Germans with with their zeppelins flying to mm. to uh, to Argentina, um, and you know that was for the rich, and they had a level of comfort which which was commensurate with their wealth. You know, mm. um, but you know when when air travel became safe enough for for, for people to generally fly it. Um, you know, people were demanding to go on these flights and, and you know, these companies had to respond to commercial pressure. Mm. So there we are. So it will happen. But anyway, yeah, Mary, uh, Mary, Mary has a point, yeah. I think. Yeah. Um, yeah. I was um, I got asked about this when I did a talk in the school recently um, about people going up on things like the Blue Origin stuff. And every person that has ever been to space, when they come back and get interviewed, they talk about how fragile Earth looked from space. Mm -hmm. And I think the more people that see it from that, and see it in those eyes then yeah. the more chance we have Absolutely. of actually doing something to save the planet because yeah. we need to do something drastic to save um yeah. save our planet and i think if more people see it that way and see the fragility of it from space it can only be a good thing i'd mm -hmm. like to hope anyway yeah <laughs> Steve i think something didn't you Steve? Well, Did just climate want... stripes badge on here. It oh, okay. Is. I know we're I know we're fascinated and enthralled with space, but the most important thing right now is our our own planet Earth. Really, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Although people well, talk about saving the planet, which of course is complete misnomer, because the planet will carry on regardless of whether it's <laughs> on it or not. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it, we're talking about saving our lifestyles, basically. Yeah. That's, that's what we're really talking uh, about. I will say as well, we have planted a tree. <laughs> well, that's true. That's true, man. <laughs> all right, then. Sorry, Steve, go on. Well, I was just going to say, I hope that by the time we can all easily and cheaply go up into space, that my senior citizen's discount rate will still apply. But, uh... <laughs> you, you want the space equivalent of the senior citizen's rail card? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that would be good. Yeah, but when I became eligible for a, a bus pass uh, a couple of years ago, you know, I was absolutely horrified. Um, and uh, and I, I still haven't claimed it. I just can't bring myself to do it, you know. Uh, but when somebody on the train offered me their seat, I thought, oh, <laughs> God, <laughs> now that is really bad. When somebody on the train, I was, I was on, you know, the, the, when I was uh, working in Barcelona and commuting every day, um, you know, an hour on the train, it wasn't uncommon for the train to be full and for there to be no seats. And uh, I was standing up and a young lad of maybe 20 years old said, would you like my seat? And uh, and I thought, oh God, has it really come to this? Has it really, <laughs> really, really come to this? But I took his seat because I'm not stupid, you know. And um, so um, so I had his seat. Uh, but I was sitting there thinking, God, this is really bad. This is so bad. And perhaps I better go and get that bus pass and that rail pass and whatever. Anyway, so there we are. Moving on. Um, I think Keith, you had some stuff for us this week, didn't you? You're on oh, mute. Need some news. Yes, there we are. sorry about that, folks. I keep doing that. Um, yeah, I'm going to turn my background off first. Uh, you'll see why in a second. Um, right, bear with me a second while I do that. I approve of the current background. <laughs> <laughs> yes, me too. It's lovely. Right, the, the reason for doing that is, uh, well, as you know, we when we were on Astro Radio Earth, it was a rock show. So I'm going to do some rocks. And, hey! uh, <laughs> Tell us about that one. And, uh, it's I, like Pete Peter, this, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. These tend to disappear if you have a virtual background, you know, so I'm right. holding it up now. Uh, this is a very unusual uh, looking igneous rock. It's uh, called an ignimbrite. And what you're seeing here are devitrified shards of glass. They've been blasted out of a volcano at extremely high temperature, so much so that you can see they're actually molten or were molten and they've, uh, you know, sort of elongated. 
And uh, this is the kind of thing that happened at uh, Montpellier on Martinique in 1902. And I think I'm right in saying that the uh, volcano that uh, erupted there um, actually managed to kill 25,000 people. Wow. Now, uh, and, and by the way, there's a, a, an interesting twist to the tale because one of the few survivors was a condemned prisoner in a cell. Um, but he was underground, so he survived. His name was Louis Caparis. Anyway, I always uh, like to uh, t tell people of religious faith that story and say, well, what, what was, where was God that day? Anyway, that's by the way. The thing is that uh, this uh, is uh, a typical ignibrite from Earth. This one's from North Wales uh, in the UK. And obviously it, a piece of rock is broken off and ended up on a beach, uh, heads a pebble. Thing is, they found ignibrites on Mars. And this was, is a, a bit of an unexpected uh, finding because if you've uh, looked at Mars volcanoes, you'll know they're big shallow-sided shield volcanoes, extinct now, of course, uh, mm. which produce low viscosity uh, magma, basaltic magma, with a low silica content. This kind of thing I'm holding in my hand, an ignin bright, is the result of a high silica a uh, high viscosity eruption where the volcano has literally blown itself to pieces. Uh, by the way, another example is Mount St. Helens, of course. Yeah. So basically, they found ignibrites on Mars, but uh, chemically, they're not like the, uh, the ones we see on Earth. This high silica ignibrite, which is a typical Earth rock, um, is different to the Martian ones because <clears throat> they contain large amounts of the mineral olivine. And if you've never seen olivine, I'm going to hold some up now, and you can see it's green. Uh, and in fact, the gemstone variety of olivine is uh, called peridot, and most of you will have heard of that. And this, in fact, is a rock called peridotite. It's from the Earth's mantle. Now, on Mars, they're getting ignium brights consisting of this material. Um, and uh, this was all found, by the way, um, rather late in the day. Uh, samples uh, analysed by the... Uh, uh, spirit rover uh, have been looked at again by some scientists from uh, University of Arizona and that's how they've discovered that they're getting olivine based ignim rice <laughs> like this <laughs> Lovely. so there clearly were some pretty explosive volcanoes going on in uh, the past of Mars now on earth we have found a few um, olivine uh, or ferromagnesium mineral dominated uh, 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 Ignin brights, but they're from the very, very early stages of the Earth's uh, geological history. Uh, they're not common on Earth. We get the other sort, the uh, high silica ones. Aha. What's he holding up there? It's green. Yeah, is that's, that's olivine. Yeah, uh, that's the same stuff. This is from the a local... Chances are you and I are holding samples up from the same uh, place. They come from the Massif Central in France. It could well um, be. Uh, well, this, this comes from a local volcano. Uh, uh -huh. Oh yeah, the, right, round where you are. Yeah, yeah, because this, you know, this is a. It was an extremely volcanic uh, area. The last, the last volcanoes erupted about ten million years ago. Um, but there's stuff like this everywhere. You can see all the the bubbles. I don't know if you can see that, but it's just yeah, with yeah. with bubbles. Yeah. Um. So yeah, that's from a that's. But you can see it's green again. It's, it's olivine. So so there we are. Yeah. Well, there yeah. you go, folks. So if you've ever seen large amounts of olivine, you've just seen loads of it tonight. And it's a fairly rare mineral because mm. it, it weathers away and breaks down into rust, basically. So yeah. uh, chances of seeing lots of it in one place are fairly slow, uh, rare. Uh, which you, So we've just shown you that. Fantastic. So have, um, they, have, have they not been able to, to date this rock on Mars yet, I suppose? Uh, I haven't got any info on that. Nothing, nothing. Because uh, that that would be yeah. incredibly important to do that to find out when. Yeah, it would, wouldn't it? I couldn't yeah. agree more. Yeah, but uh, um, yeah. Anyway, volcanicity on Mars turns out to be more diverse than previously thought. Anyway, um, well, we, I think we know thanks to insight now that the interior of Mars is more active than perhaps they were thinking because of all the Mars quakes that insight has has detected. So, yep. Uh, yep. So, yep. so there we yeah. are. Lanzarote is a great place for um, just picking up off the floor, uh, mm. olivine. Um, yep. And they make lots of jewelry and uh, things That's like right. that out of it. Mm. But, they do. Uh, it's very, it, it's it a very pretty beautiful. green. It's very pretty green. But you, yeah. you walk along and you're walking around places, and all of a sudden you'll just see this green crystalline structure actually embedded in the lava. So, uh, mm. yeah, it's super, it's, uh, yeah. super. lovely stuff. By the way, for the chemists out there, it's iron magnesium silicate. 
Um, right. Yeah. Uh, so varying amounts of iron and magnesium. Yeah. On Amazon right now. I don't want to be the only one without olivine at our next show. So. Oh, yeah. Make a note. <laughs> Bring your own olivine. There's going to be. Yeah, I can get it tomorrow. I can get it. <laughs> that's a deal. That's uh -huh. all. That's all sure. That's olivines. a challenge. Get a hold of some olivine. There we yeah. are. That, that's your. That's your uh, panel challenge for this week. Bring some olivine next week. Well, that might be olivine. Yeah. Um, no, I doubt it. <laughs> shall, I, okay. shall I do one more? For, uh, please do, please go ahead. Yeah, yes, okay. and then we'll, then we'll uh, go back to um, Daz, you've got, Daz. Do you want to present anything this week? You're, you're muted. Keith. Sorry, I was doing a Keith there. Okay, well, well, let Keith uh, <laughs> let Keith finish. I, let Keith finish his, and uh, and then we'll um, we'll come back. Okay, Keith. Sorry, go on. Yeah. We were talking about this last week, actually. Oh, we were, uh, yeah, Verona Rupes. Yeah, uh, the uh, the fifth smallest, uh, fifth largest, sorry, moon of Uranus is called Miranda. And Miranda has a very, very tall cliff, um, which is visible in the Southern Hemisphere. Now, it always seems counterintuitive that small uh, bodies in the solar system have very large, uh, you know, sort of, uh, features of relief on their surface. But if you think about it, it does make sense because they've got less gravity, so you can have taller things without them falling down. Anyway, Verona Rupees is this gigantic cliff. Uh, it's on a moon with a low gravitational pull. And not surprisingly, some people have speculated as to whether one could uh, go uh, sort of base jumping, uh, skydiving from the cliff. Well, I decided to apply a little mathematics to this. And uh, first thing to know is that there's the, the cliff, by the way, on the right there. It's 20 kilometers high, which is pretty high. I think you'll agree. And Miranda has a fairly low gravitational acceleration. On Earth, it's very nearly 10 meters per second squared. On, on Miranda, it's, uh, you know, uh, uh, less than 0.1. Uh, meters per second squared. So it's going to take you a long time to reach the bottom. Now, if you use a bit of uh, uh, simple mechanics, uh, mathematics, uh, sort of A-level stuff in Britain, um, you can use this formula, that the distance is equal to half the acceleration times the time squared. Rearrange the formula, put the numbers in, and you find that it takes you 712 seconds, about 12 minutes, from the point where you jump off the top of the cliff to the point where you reach the bottom. Now, given that weak gravitational uh, acceleration, it would seem that you're going to enjoy the journey, but you've forgotten something. Miranda has no atmosphere or near to no atmosphere, so you will just keep speeding up. You'll keep accelerating. There's no terminal velocity. And you can't deploy a parachute because without an atmosphere, it won't work. So applying another formula, how fast will you be going when you reach the bottom? And the answer is 127 miles per hour. Oh, splat. So it's going gonna, it's <laughs> gonna to hurt. <laughs> so my recommendation is, despite what you see on the internet, don't try that. <laughs> Thank you very much. Ironic, Thank you. Ironically, I, I believe that is, if, if you are uh, in free fall in the atmosphere and you're kind of flat out like this, I believe 120 miles per hour is about the terminal velocity on Earth. It is. Yes, you're right. Yeah. Ironically, um, your trip off that cliff on Miranda will result in you having a velocity which is very similar to the terminal velocity on Earth. And, uh, of course, uh, there are some recorded incidences of people falling out of planes at high altitude without a functioning parachute. Um, there was a tail gunner from a British bomber in World War II uh, who fell. And of course, they all reach the same terminal velocity when they're close to the ground. Whether they survive or not is not how fast they go, but how fast they stop. Um, yeah. the, the change of momentum. And this uh, uh, REF uh, gunner uh, fell into a forest and broke his way through a multitude of branches in the wow. trees before reaching the ground and survived the fall. But he doesn't hold the record. The record is actually held by a member of the cabin crew of an East German airliner, uh, which broke up in flight and she was in the tail section, which I don't know whether it went down like a sycamore seed or what, but she survived as well. Um, so you can survive a very large fall. But I still don't recommend jumping off that cliff in Miranda. 
<laughs> well, well, Keith, when I was young, I, I was an avid collector of books like this. Ah, uh, right. This is the Tell Me Why Annual 1970, which was full of interesting facts like that. And, and that, that story about the, the guy falling out of the Lancaster, uh, I read in one of these books. So uh, I, I know that it's true. It must be so. It's in, the, in my book. I should point out that neither walked away from their experience. <laughs> <laughs> they were in hospital for a long time. Uh, but at yeah. least he lived. At least he lived. OK. <laughs> Um, Eve had his hand up. Well, no, I was just going to say that if at any point in future the panel are, are going to attempt any base jumping, I definitely want some senior citizens discount for that. <laughs> <laughs> what, a discount in the height? <laughs> yeah, I agree. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. OK, thank you so much for that, Keith. All very interesting. Uh, we'll, we'll briefly go to Daz because you've got a couple of things I think you yeah, want to just a couple of things I want to point out. Yeah. One of them was with um, Barnard's uh, presentation, and he was talking about the Trappist uh, One uh, system. And he was talking about the three planets um, in the Goldilocks zone. Um, well, of course, um, as he's pointed out, we don't know whether they've got atmosphere or if they have got atmosphere, they can support any form of life. But somebody must be uh, quite confident because METI, which is uh, Messaging uh, Extraterrestrial Intelligence, um, in their wisdom, using the Goonhilly Site Service Station in England, which is based down in Cornwall, down on the south coast, um, they're actually going to be sending a message to TRAPPIST-1 system. Um, and to, to try and attract attention, you know, somebody will be stood there <laughs> waving and uh, you know, they'll send it to thing and all that. Um, and they're hoping, but well, basically, I, I don't know how serious this is, the intention is. I mean, um, maybe there is intelligent life there or, or not. But um, they're, they're basing, they're, like I said, they're, they're aiming towards this system. Um, and uh, because it possibly could contain liquid uh, water and things like that there. Um, but the TRAPPIST-1 system is 39 uh, light years away so it would take as few as 78 years for intelligent life to receive the message and for us to get an answer so no i won't be around to answer the phone when it comes when the call comes but uh, i just thought i'd like to uh, add that to the uh, the, the mix with uh, trappist one system yes barnard yeah i, I just Thanks for that. I'd just like to add, couldn't they just wait in a year until JWST does all their observations <laughs> yeah. before deciding? <laughs> well, yeah. like I said, they, they're not going to beat JW, uh, the, the James Webb because it's going to take 78 years for a round trip. And of course, <laughs> we've been doing this message in the, uh, the stars um, M13, if I remember right, was the Arecibo. Mm. message and that's going to be hundreds and uh, hundreds of years before we get even if they even pick it up um if there's anything there and it's just just um i mean met has been going for quite some time because somebody also mentioned um fast the chinese um uh radio telescope the the largest one um and that will also be beaming messages apparently into the center in towards the center of the um milky way galaxy um over the next few years so uh i mean if we get a reply then you know we get a reply but uh, i hope it's reverse charges because uh, we are going to pick <laughs> up the bill um but just the, a couple of other things um i'd just like to mention that next monday the 13th is the fourth database dump of gaia um now uh, gaia was um is a telescope is a space telescope which has been sat at um Lagrange point two, which is where the James Webb is. Um, and it's been studying the stars in the center uh, in the Milky Way. And it's been studying millions of them. And it just keeps constantly taking images, 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 images. And I think we possibly, all, most of us have seen the, the animation that they made of all the stars and the prediction of where they're going to go over the next few thousand years. Yeah, uh, just amazing, from these images. amazing animation. And they made an animation. You can see all these stars whirling around and things like that. Um, but we've got the fourth dump. Um, and I thought, to be quite honest, I thought this was the last, the last one. But apparently it's going on, I think it's till uh, uh, 2027. And there's possibly another two, maybe three more dumps to come afterwards. But of course, this data we're going to be getting is going to be mega. It's going to be absolutely, uh, and you can see um, citizen science going absolutely mad, trying to go through all this data because not one person, not one team, 
probably not one country of of uh, scientists will be able to go through all this data so we've got a lot to look forward to um and just another dig um at uh, just to sort of like get a bit of a dig in at uh, nasa and all that the last couple of years they've been trying to um how can i say dispose of sophia um which uh, is a airborne um observatory it's infrared it, the telescope sits in the um, base of a um, 747 and it takes off it flies to extreme heights so it takes the uh, telescope above most of the atmosphere so it, it gets rid of a lot of all the water vapor which interferes with observations and things like that and it's been doing this for you know quite a few years now but um, NASA have decided the they're not getting um, the value for money so they've been trying to get rid of it for the last couple of years and a, uh, out of the blue came a study um, this, uh, th this week, actually, which has uh, been reported in Nature. And they, over the last three years, using SOFIA, um, they have been observing um, galactic um, galaxies. Galactic galaxies, what's that? Uh, <laughs> galaxies. Um, and what they've been looking at is that um, a few years back, I don't know if we can, if people can remember that. I mean, our minds are going. Uh, but a few years back, there was um, a big furore about they were studying galaxies, large galaxies, in uh, in the optical um, uh, light sec uh, section, and they found that basically these galaxies, when they did spectrometry on on the uh, intergalactic. Uh, medium, which is the gate gaps between the stars and all that in these galaxies, they seem to be devoid of metallicity. Now, when we talk about metallicity, we talk about elements that are higher um, atomic weights, uh, higher than um, hydrogen or helium. And we talk about the metallicity of the sun. Um, so any elements that are higher in the periodic table than um, uh, the, the hydrogen and helium uh, we call metals now people don't really well i suppose there is a reason somewhere along that but i just like to think we're messing with the chemists in their minds you know because they <laughs> it does they do their nuts in when we talk about metallicity anyway back to these um galaxies but they couldn't see the um because as we know the suns are the producers of all the elements and all that as they go through their their lives and once they come to the end of the lives, they either puff off, puff off their uh, outer layers and seed the surrounding area with the elements that they produce during their lifetime, or they go supernova and produce even heavier elements, but again, seed the uh, areas. And what they were saying is that they couldn't see this metallicity in these uh, spectrograph readings. So um, what this team did is they've decided, they took using Sophie, uh, Sophia, they um, took images in the infrared and then put that through the spectrograph and they found all of this, these missing elements. They are there. And just to prove it, they compared them to the same size galaxies um, without lots of ga uh, dust and the, um, the, uh, these galaxies that do have the gust, dust and they're virtually the same. The, mes the metals are there. Um, and they were say because at the time when they found all these low metal galaxies, they wrote lots of papers and lots of theses came out why they um, uh, did, were not showing all the elements that they should be doing in the uh, interstellar clouds and things like that. And they think it's due to all the dust and things like that, which is blocked the um, the optical light uh, from being able to show the um, the metals in the thing so that was it i just wanted to have a dig the fact that i think sophie is a, a fantastic observatory it's done wonderful work and for some reason they've decided they want to get rid of it well perhaps, perhaps they'll uh, reconsider now okay well, thanks for that daz yeah, right. um lou can i ask you to hold back the remainder of the stuff you've got for next week sure that yeah. that's great all right 
because I think now we've uh, we've bothered people long enough with our with our prattling. Uh, we'd like to thank you, our viewers, very much for being here this evening. And uh, again, we'd, we'd love it if you subscribe to the channel and tick the notification bell and do all that stuff, because that will uh, that will help us, uh, you know, grow our channel and do the things that we really want to, because we'd like to do uh, a lot more stuff with this with this Space Oddities channel, because the sky's the limit, if, uh, if you'll forgive me for saying that. Not it helps Steve get his senior discounts too. Yeah, so. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. don't forget Steve's senior discounts. Yeah. Thank you so much for being with us this evening. We'll be back, of course, next week at the same time, same bat channel. And uh, until then, we'd like to wish you a very good week. And thanks once again for being here. Take care of yourselves and we'll see you next week. So until then, if you have any comments that you think of after the program, do put them, uh, do, uh, do, do get in touch and, and, and ask us about it. You can put comments in the channel now if, if in the chat window if you'd like to but uh, otherwise you can save until next week and if you have any questions we'll be more than glad to answer them so have a lovely week everybody and we'll see you next week bye 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 for now bye bye, bye. 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 you'll find my olivine all right that's a wrap <laughs> <Hold on. laughs>